Hey, it's Tyler, host of the Tyler Knows Everything podcast, where the nose is crossed out because I always want to learn more. Because this episode involves automation and artificial intelligence, I'm going to let the AI version of myself create this intro rather than the human version for increased accuracy and efficiency. The human version is currently catching up on reruns of The Office. As usual, I'll go ahead and get all the advertisements out of the way right now, so there's no interruption during the content of the show. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by my patrons on Patreon. This month's patrons include Ty Kudrain, Roxanne and Eric Helberg, Judge Mitch Templeton, Mark McKee, Joe Gilbreth, Paul Prospery, Zach Hawthorne, Wade Adair, and Joe Gilbreth. You too can sponsor this creative effort for as little as $5. Just go to patreon.com slash Tyler Knows Everything. That's www.patreon.com slash Tyler Knows Everything. For compliance, I'd like to mention that Judge Mitch Templeton sponsors this podcast as a political ad paid for by the Mitch Templeton for Judge campaign. And my legal disclaimer, all content is intellectual property of Tyler Troutman and not to be reused for 1,000 years. My guest today is a subject matter expert on IoT, or the Internet of Things, which is a system of interrelated computing devices, mechanical and digital machines, provided with unique identifiers and the ability to transfer data over a network without requiring human-to-human or human-to-computer interaction. Please welcome the super interesting and highly intelligent Tim Vogel. Tyler knows everything. You may not realize this, but you're the biggest YouTube celebrity to ever be in the studio. Really? Yeah. Why is that? Well, you are you have the luxury of being on corporate YouTube. Yes. So, you know, you've got the views. Thousands. You know, yeah. You've got customers that are troubleshooting and <laughs> trying to figure it out versus maybe like infotainment. That's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I do it for the benefit of others. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. And in a longer period of time, you know, you started years ago. Yes. So, uh, <laughs> so before we jump into, you know, maybe some KMC stuff, can you, Sure. anytime I have a super interesting and highly intelligent person in the studio, <laughs> I want to try to explore where they came from and how they got to where they are now. Yeah. So maybe take us back to what might be relevant to, for your journey. Sure. Yeah. So I'll say that if you want to go back to what's relevant to this mm -hmm. conversation, yeah. I started uh, you know, I started in college as a graphic design major. Okay. I was not good at art. And just for technology reference, yes. how far back in your age would be dial-up internet? So I grew up with dial-up internet. Yeah, so me yeah. as well. So so dial-up for me would be all through high school because, yeah. because cable hadn't quite been invented until I got to college dorms and it was Ethernet. So yeah. that was like our first yeah. Ethernet. So. I'm trying to think when we got DSL, mm -hmm. I think I was in high school. Which wasn't much better, by the way. No, yeah. it wasn't much better, but it seemed so much better because it was yeah. always on, right? Yeah. It was just yeah. like a, this constant flow of information. Right, right. And, uh, you know, instead of taking like three minutes to download a song, I can get it in like 45 seconds. Three minutes is pretty fast. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so, you know, I was I was design, uh, creative design studio two on the Adobe version. Okay. Right? Yeah. So that was when I started. And again, I was not artistic. Mm -hmm. I didn't enjoy art classes, but I wanted to do graphic design. Mostly mm -hmm. I just liked computers and I liked websites. And so I was like, oh, I want to do that. Right. After a semester of doing everything I could to not fail my drawing classes, uh, I decided, you know, I think what I really want to do is marketing. Mm -hmm. And that's when I just started down the whole path of marketing and content creation and, you know, how can I get in front of people and get better at having conversations and you know, ultimately selling products, right? Mm -hmm. And so I went uh, I went down that route, still kind of developing my graphic design apart or alongside, you know, understanding how businesses operate and you know, what's important, how to get a message across, how to communicate something. So it's important to your target audience. And then once I uh, got through that, I realized, okay, I want to get more into business now with this kind of as a backdrop. So I was constantly just trying to work my way up to to get more onto the business side, the strategy side, mm -hmm. understanding the importance of communication along the way. Right. Not only uh, verbal communication, but visual communication as well. So having all that together then was sort of, you know, drove my, um, 
my uh, my focus and going to get my MBA mm-hmm. and how I could utilize marketing and communication to that and then also understand. Yeah. You know, so where all did you go for I, uh, undergrad and graduate? I went to Indiana. Well, so I started off at Indiana Wesleyan University. Mm-hmm. And then I went to Indiana University South Bend, and I got my undergrad and my MBA there. Right. Yeah, Is that just same? down the street from Notre Dame. Yeah, same yes. city, right? Yes. And so the graphic design does kind of go hand-in-hand hand with marketing because nowadays it seems like a lot of companies expect their marketing department to be able to be well-versed in, in graphic design mm-hmm. and even other content creation for that matter. And I know that's helped me where – I started out the podcast with webcams and then upgrade to HD cams. And I used to outsource my editing. And then I said, you know, I really need to learn how to do the editing myself. Mm-hmm. And it's all just kind of self-taught. And I'm able to merge that with my career and make content for them. Uh, even though it's not expected, it's just fun to do. Yep. And it, it's easier during this time to send someone a video link than it is to get an in-person meeting. So yes. especially if you have that content out there, where, whereas you with your company, you've got hundreds of videos on every topic. Right. And you can just say, click, 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 send, send, send. Yeah. So the thing that we've seen change in the last 20 years with the advent of the Internet, more people getting you know, super computers in their pockets, these mm-hmm. little glowing rectangles, is that the life time of a piece of content is so much shorter than it was mm-hmm. 15, 20 years ago. Right. So you've had these huge ad companies, which obviously are still, you know, play a huge role because they have the brain power and the bandwidth and the, you know, capability of executing these national campaigns. Uh, but so many small businesses or medium sized businesses, what they really need is just those short, small pieces of content mm-hmm. that because of the technology that's now available at the consumer level, anyone can create. Right. So that it can live for 48 hours before the next thing comes out. Mm-hmm. So you don't need, you know, that $1,000 piece of content. You can do a $5 piece of content. Yeah. And if you had, you know, 50 of those now, you know, you're off and running. So that's kind of an yeah. interesting aspect of that. Yeah. The, the world's most popular phone that people have in their pocket is a 4K camcorder. Yes. And not only 4K, but you can even set it HDR. for 60 frames per second if, yeah. you, if you want to. Uh-huh. You know, it's, it's wild that that has become the – because you used to have digital cameras and you had your phone. And you say, oh, I'm going on vacation. I want to take some good pictures, grab the digital camera, and bring that along. Because you don't want to take pictures on the phone. The phone used to be grainy, you know, especially a flip mm-hmm. phone. Yep. Now, um, I mean, the phone is better than any camera that I've ever, ever owned. Yeah, the point and shoots. Mm-hmm. That's not really a thing. <laughs> right. Yeah, anymore, it's not, yeah. Yeah. That market has totally gone away. I think uh, the, I think that aisle is gone from Walmart. And no. <laughs> it, it it truly played out in reality this past week because my my daughter's going into high school and they needed to take cheerleading pictures for the school program. And we have a group chat on GroupMe. It's uh, for the freshmen. There's 14 cheer moms and then myself. It's wonderful. Can't, can't tell you how much I love getting those notifications. Yeah. Uh, and I'll we'll circle back to that about decision making of female versus male in a minute. But back to the technology reference. So we needed to take one group picture, okay? Like they're standing in a cool place and they take a picture. And a mom contacted a photographer and the photographer wanted to charge like $90 per girl, like times 14. And I said, hold on. I was like, first of all, if we pulled that amount of money together, not only could we buy an iPhone 11 Pro Max, yeah. we could also buy a, a Nikon. Yeah. <laughs> and bes- But besides all that, uh, about a year ago, I took these same group of girls for my daughter's birthday to Houston. We went to Cheesecake Factory. But the, the event was we went to all the Houston wall murals and took like cool photography shots. It was just me and my phone and mm. a few filters. And I think that was might have been the iPhone 7 that I had back then. Yeah. So anyways... I sent to the, the the group chat, hey, I've been known to take some cool pictures in some pretty cool locations, and I would do it for free. You know? oh, so, yeah, yeah we – Burn. Of paying, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Slammed them. Yep. Instead of paying that photographer, you know, $1,400 to take a, a digital picture, like – because right. some of the moms are like, are we getting prints? Or like, no, it's a yeah. digital picture. So long story short, I ended up doing it for free because, yeah, yeah you can you can do that now. and Yeah. Well, and then – But that took uh, 35 – back and forth messages to convince them by the way yeah well well you're very persuasive right i can tell well you look at you know the iphone and the portrait mode yeah like just the kind of picture it's like it seems 
so right. much nicer and all you did was make the background blurry yeah you know be, so be, it gives this even like a perception of quality that isn't there but it doesn't matter because when you look at the photo you're just like wow look how great that photo looks yeah i always get it backwards it's a dslr or d yes. uh, did i get it right on you the first are, yeah. Yeah. it's like a usb stick you i don't know if i get it right on the first yeah. with the acronym but <laughs> those type of cameras have so many switches and settings that i can never own one because i don't know how to use it yeah, it's just too, turn it, it to the a auto mode yeah now with the iphone it's made it you know dummy proof you because you, you stick it. it on portrait mode, and yep. all of a sudden you're a professional photographer. Yeah. Well, and then they have the night mode, so you can get like a 10-second exposure. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know. I, I ran across like a 30-second exposure. Yeah. So we were up in, you know, Taos, Michigan mm -hmm. a couple weeks ago, and I'm taking pictures, you know, this long exposure. I'm getting stars and the, mm -hmm. you know, the moon and the beautiful reflection off the waves, you know, because like – this is a really nice little camera here. Right. That I've, was great. I've seen some in pitch black that look like daytime with that long exposure. Yeah. Now, if you have a person, you have to stand real still. Yes. Because if you if you flinch, it'll it'll blur you a little bit. But for, I got the ISS. Um, I got a little I got a little stripe through the sky. Oh. Yeah. That's, so that was yeah, pretty that's cool. Phenomenal. <laughs> yeah. Because you know I'm into uh, astrophysics I've, as a hobby. Yeah. And so we we tend to track that. Uh, well, I'm in a group called the Astronomical Society of Southeast Texas. We meet at the planetarium. It's uh, super cool people, not nerdy at all. Yeah, no. yeah, no, <laughs> never. But uh, they, I got into it because telescopes are expensive. They already have all the telescopes. You can rent them or check them out. You don't even have to. You just be a member of the club, and right. you can get those telescopes. So, yeah. like uh, pretty nice ones, like like six foot, inch. six foot tall, ten inch. You know, where you can you can because it's really life changing to look through an eyepiece and see the rings of Saturn with your own eyes. Oh, like wow. no, nothing's between you and that other world, but just this this uh, mirror mm -hmm. or Jupiter. Yeah. You know, those are the really uh, cool because in in town you have to have some a big object to look at because of the light pollution if you oh, go yeah. further out where there's no light pollution then you can look at deeper sky objects but most of the time for astronomy outreach projects we just set it up to look at the moon or saturn or jupiter and then yep. inv invite kids to to come look and it's amazing how fast the moon and the earth move because when once it's centered on the moon you literally have to adjust it every minute or so because yeah. it's moving a thousand miles an hour you know we're rotating <laughs> yeah. it's moving and you know, the first time I saw the Milky Way, I was in Tucson, mm -hmm. and I'd never been to Tucson before, and I was at a corporate event, and we had just finished a chili uh, cooking mm -hmm. contest. We lost too much salt. Oh, okay. Uh, but uh, they said, we're at Old Tucson. It's this old movie studio where they filmed hundreds of Westerns. They said, so, you know, the bar is open. Hang out if you want to go see, you know, this it's essentially like a ghost town at night. If you want to go out there, just, you know, watch out for critters. I'm like, okay, well, you know, I'll go. Everyone goes to the bar. I go outside, so I'm out there by myself. And, you know, there's lights on throughout the studio. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, I looked up, and I just saw so many stars. I couldn't believe it. Not even kidding you. This Native American gentleman comes out of the shadows mm -hmm. slowly and is walking towards me. He goes, you want to see something really cool? When somebody asks you like that, yeah, whether you want to see something really cool, what do you say? Absolutely, I do. Sure. <laughs> yeah. So he's like, follow me. He turns around, walks back into the shadow, and I just follow him by myself. But he brought me behind the building where it was pitch black, and he yeah. goes, take a look at that. Right. And I looked up, and it twice, three times as many as I saw just on the other side of that sure. building. Mm -hmm. And you could just see that Milky Way right across Right, the, the Great sky. Rift. Yeah. It was phenomenal, and I yeah. couldn't believe it. And then he just started telling me about how Tucson's the, you know, the um, stargazing capital of the world. Right. And, and he's telling me all about, uh, was it Kit, uh, Katie, Kitty? What's the the hill? There's a hill there. It's re really famous with lots of different telescopes on it. Oh, right. Commercial yeah. telescopes. And it was just, it was phenomenal. Yeah. So speaking of Arizona, I had to cancel a trip to Sedona back in April because that's kind of when everything hit with the shutdown. And mm, I just yeah. wasn't sure what was going on. But Sedona is known as the spiritual vortex of the earth. Uh, it's kind of a, you know, a hip, hippie thing. Sure. Uh, yeah. It's a, it's a, a town that has regulations against light pollution so they don't allow too much light at a certain time of day and so you can very you have a very good dark sky mm. and that's some place because you can't see the milky way here in in texas unless you go to like big bend or mm -hmm. further out mm -hmm. and so i was really looking forward to to that trip to being able to see at night the last time i saw something like that was probably casper wyoming in 2017 i camped out for the total solar eclipse to be in path of totality oh wow sure and yeah. since i was camping that first night I got up to go to the the restroom at a porta potty, and I I remember instead of going to the restroom, I just kind of sat there with my eyes open and, and jaw yeah. open, just looking at everything that I hadn't been able to see back home for so long. Yeah, 
So it's was, it was very neat. And you let your eyes adjust for like five, ten minutes. And yeah, just, just close your eyes for a little bit, let it, let it get dark. It's um, crazy. I think more people would appreciate it if Andromeda was a little bit brighter. And you could see an entire, not not just another planet, not just another solar system, but an entire galaxy just right, right there. Yeah. Um, now, being that it's going to collide with us pretty soon, people are going to be able to see it like that. But that'll be before fairly me. soon. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll be gone relatively and, soon. And I think it's actually after our sun goes red giant, so we won't even, uh, you know, as a planet, won't even be around to see it. <laughs> But uh, I wanted to see if you could walk us through kind of the history of maybe KMC controls. Sure. And they're fascinating to me because they do United States manufacturing. And they're manufacturing circuit boards and electronics, things that are commonly outsourced. I mean, oh, yeah. if you think of the most commonly outsourced to another country manufacturing, it would be, you know, chips and circuits and electronics. Mm-hmm. And it's fascinating that they've kept that in-house or in-country. And it's also fascinating how they do it uh, because it's it's not anything that requires a high level of expertise with that area. You know, it's 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 mostly women, ladies that mm-hmm. probably didn't grow up as a computer programmer, or but they're they're making these fantastic electronic products. Yeah. So, so yeah, what we say is we're very vertically integrated, mm-hmm. and part of that is because we just take a ton of pride in what we do and how we manufacture it. Um, I think we're were owned and operated by a bunch of tinkerers mm-hmm. that you know just you know love the technology and love being able to learn about it and see how it works and then produce a high quality product that'll last decades. We were talking about that earlier, uh-huh. right? Yeah, yeah. Still family but, owned. That's right. And family pri- owned. Privately held. Privately held. We're going into third generation of uh, ownership and management. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was started 50 years ago by Ken Cruder. Yeah. So the K, of course, stands for Cruder. Yes. And Cruder Manufacturing Company. Yeah. And there's still Cruders there to this day. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. So. Um, he started, he was originally with Robert Shaw. He was leading the engineering firm there, or the engineering department there. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know all the nuances of why he left, but he decided to leave. And he signed an agreement that said, you know, he wouldn't compete. And so uh, started off, at, you know, just crossed the border a ways into Canada. Oh. Uh, and then transitioned back after the non-compete had, had ended and then came back uh, to the U.S. and Started all with pneumatics mm-hmm. in the 80s, went into more digital, where our KMD line came from. And then uh, I'm not sure how much longer after that we then moved to just yeah. kind of open digital controls. And so and people people that may not know, sure. we can kind of tell them what you're talking about. There's, you know, all of your, oh, yeah. all of your large, <laughs> yeah. large buildings typically yes. don't work like your house where people just have free reign to go push a button on a thermostat. Right. There, there needs to be an element of control. Uh, for example, a tall building that has a chiller or a boiler is going to pump that cold air or that hot air throughout the entire building. And there's going to be dampers that open or close depending mm-hmm. on what the occupant wants. And so uh, at Comfort Controls, my company, we design and install these systems that are manufactured by you guys at, right. at KMC Controls. Do you ever find it hard when you meet someone, say, from out of town and they say, uh, so what do you do? Yeah. Do you find it hard to explain that in a, in a short one sentence? Yeah, so I'll say something like smart buildings. Like, okay. yeah, I'm in okay. smart buildings. They're like, oh, okay. Yeah. What, what does that mean? And then they want to know right. more. So yeah, yeah. Right, so it's like that next question. So really, I just need to, I just need to skip I've, that question. I've found that there's never a short answer because never a short answer. I tell them building automation systems, and they're like, their next question is, what is that? And yeah. so HVAC, like, like escalators and elevators? Right. So they no, say HVAC controls, and they say, what is that? Yeah. And then there's also a part <laughs> of me that wants it to sound cooler than maybe it really is. Right. So then I have to go down that rabbit hole. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, indoor air quality? Yeah. Temperature? Mm-hmm. We make sure it's it's warm enough for you. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah there's, there's really no good way to, of putting it. Yeah. I just say that I, you know, I work for a uh, controls manufacturer mm-hmm. that runs the air handling units right or air conditioners for large buildings <laughs> and so it's like we were going back it started out in pneumatics mm-hmm. and there's still buildings to this day we just visited one that had yeah. has a pneumatic system and so that's a an air compressor a giant air compressor that has to run nonstop, use enormous amounts of electricity yep and mechanical moving parts versus and a maze of copper tubing oh yeah yep, yeah throughout the entire building that. right uh versus digital which is just ones and zeros and mm-hmm. smaller amounts of electricity telling actuators to open or close mm-hmm. and uh, thermostats receiving information via Ethernet cords. Yeah, with very minute changes depending mm-hmm. on the zone or the room that you're in. And, right. Yeah, and then all of that then 
communicated back where there's you know voting protocols Mm -hmm. between all these different zones to see you know what the you know what kind is it going to be hot air is it going to be cold air how much of it and then you know the system itself is just a very complex engineering uh feat every time then every building is different even two buildings that are built the exact same Mm -hmm. could and may and most likely will behave very differently Right. Yeah. So yeah. It's it, like its own ecosystem. Yeah. It's almost like the building is alive mm-hmm. in, a, in in a sense. And so where you come in, you've kind of gotten the uh, the cloud based flagship program. Uh, right. Yeah. So that was sort of the next. And we talked about those digital controls back in the '80s, and then um, uh, more advanced digital controls, computer um, uh, programs, and and all that. That's controlling it, and the graphics, the 3D graphics, and floor plans. Mm-hmm. And now what we started doing about five years ago. Uh, teaming up with Intel and Dell is going down this road of IoT or Internet of Things. Mm -hmm. And how do we now connect all of those buildings together uh, in all these disparate systems inside of these you know, dumb buildings, if you will, and then right. make them smart. Mm-hmm. But we say we don't want to make them just smart or intelligent. We want to make them genius buildings. Yeah. yeah. So that's the the mantra of KMC Controls is we're the building geniuses. Right. Yeah. So by bringing all that to the cloud, now not only do you give remote visibility, how you can perform better service, you can better understand what your building is doing, you can change things remotely, get alarms remotely, but now we have all the integration capabilities to tie into any platform out there that is relevant to a building, whether it's physical security of cameras or access control, whether you're talking about lighting or irrigation systems, maybe you're talking about uh, penetration testing on the IT network and now also bringing that into the OT network. If you're talking about indoor air quality, you know how can you get visibility for any number of stakeholders, whether it's the building owner or the uh, parents of children that are going to K through 12 schools or the children of parents that are in retirement homes. Uh, maybe we're talking about more in-depth analytics or artificial intelligence, AI. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, it's any any number of things. So in a lot of ways, we are a conduit of data mm-hmm. and information out of this very complex ecosystem. Right. So now you can better understand it and then push that data wherever you want it to go. Yeah. For To me, it seems like the trend is moving towards more automation versus less automation and moving most mo- definitely yeah, <laughs> yeah for sure yeah well industry 4.0 right mm-hmm. it, the whole concept of that is that we are entering the fourth industrial revolution ah. and so you know it started off with uh you know steam engines and then mm-hmm. it went to the assembly line and now we're talking about computers completely revolutionizing every tiny detail inside of these you know massive ecosystems i do kind of wish that we would have stuck with steam engines permanently because then we would be living in that steampunk era as technology <laughs> increases yeah. we, everything is steam powered. like your your personal car is steam powered your yeah. skateboard is steam powered yeah and then we could dress like that too like victorian futurism yes but uh, we just have to reserve that to halloween renaissance festival and burning man it looks like i'm in where is burning man it's near sedona it's in the black rock desert of nevada um i don't know if it's nevada or nevada but it occurs every labor day weekend it got canceled for 2021 which i'm very disappointed uh i've got to go there one year just to experience but it got canceled this year because of and next year possibly next year Whoa, well, I'm sorry. So 2020 got canceled. I don't got know. It. I don't know about 2021. I was like, yet. wow. Yeah. I wouldn't expect the organizers of Burning Man right. to I'm, be I'm looking over, that far yeah. ahead. I'm over 2020, so I'm I'm thinking about 2021. <laughs> yeah. But it, it, you have to bring everything that you need to be self-sufficient for a week, and it's it's a self-governing city for one week. Yeah. Uh, among other things. So. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but there's like these million-dollar art structures that yeah. that go up there the week before. And at the end of the week, they burn everything right. to, to show that everything in life is temporary, even yeah. these billion-dollar art structures. And there, there's wild structures of LED lights that have EKG heart rate monitors so that you can connect everyone's heartbeat and control the lighting based on the pulses and create music. It, you know, just wild stuff like that. It's super interesting. Where, where else in the world are you ever going to see something like that or experience yeah. something like that? Or get pictures for your Instagram with that particular background right yeah that's, that's probably the, the biggest thing that i mean that's what i'm going for you yeah, gotta yeah. do it the for Instagram the gram shots the cram uh, but in addition to Hashtag that you have the to gram. you have to survive for, in the desert for a week yeah in a alkaline lake dry basin mm-hmm. where the dust is like it's like you never get the dust off of you it's like mm-hmm. glitter mm-hmm. um the the dust that you bring home that week is gonna so be, have you done this before 
No. Okay, you just want to do it. Right, right. Got it. Yeah. There's several wild things that I want to yeah. do in my life. There's some serious yeah. pent up demand inside <laughs> of you for Burning Man. I can there see is. it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, your glow is changing. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, just thinking about it. Yeah. Um, so, but going back to the automation and trending in technology, you know, we're talking about on the way here, what do you think about automated driving versus human driving? There's lots of, uh, talk on which one's going to be better. And right. Right, right now we have a, probably a disproportional mix mash. There's more human drivers than there are machine drivers. Correct. There's going to come a time where that overtakes, uh, similar to the horse and buggy. There used to be more horse and buggies and less cars, and then one overtook the other. I think that we will eventually get to a point where human driving becomes recreation. Right. And, like, you'll go to a close track, and our great-great-grandkids will be like, you know, Grandpa drove his own car? That's insane. Well, you know, there was a time where rich people had cars, poor people had horses, Mm -hmm. and now poor people have cars and rich people have horses. So it completely flip-flopped. Right. Yeah. yeah. And horses so, became recreation rather than yeah. transportation. Right. Yeah. So I yeah. think that there's a there's a similar trend on the way. I don't I, I cannot imagine now again, lots of people couldn't imagine things, but I cannot imagine a time where uh, you you can't drive a vehicle mm-hmm. yourself. I can imagine a time where you're not allowed to, like on the road, but yeah. you know, taking it to a racetrack or something like that. Um, you know, I I think you know, go-karts and four-wheelers you know and tractors and all those things i mean mm-hmm. yeah it, it, it's just it's it seems so ingrained in my mind like to walk away from that completely just mm-hmm. seems impossible yeah. but no i think um that's very futuristic thinking looking now you know it's all about perception and mentality mm-hmm. of what that human versus uh, artificial intelligence driving was. And what we were talking about earlier was the concept of if 30,000 people are killed in human accidents and 20,000 people are killed in uh, automated you know, AI accidents, that 20,000 in our current mindset is way more um, tragic and mm-hmm. preposterous. Than, it'll, it'll get more press. Right, yeah, yeah. than the 30,000 of human error mm-hmm. because we understand human error and we can sympathize with it, whereas with uh, you know AI and artificial intelligence, we when blame it, right? A human could have stopped. Mm-hmm. Yes, a human possibly could have stopped and made a, a different decision. Although with all thirty thousand of these, that probably would have been grouped in with the ten thousand that you know mm-hmm. sure. <laughs> the AI was able to stop. Yeah. But again, it's just a matter of understanding and how much control are we will- willing to give up. I think where you would really notice the safety benefits is if all the cars were automated because they would communicate with each other. Right. So the car that's causing a a 10 car pileup for humans is going to communicate with all the cars behind it. Mm -hmm. And they can communicate fat. Like when, when your car puts on its brake lights, the amount of time that it takes for us to see the brake lights and then react with your foot and then the person behind and so on, that's a chain reaction is, is like slow motion to a computer. Mm-hmm. Like the computer is like, wow, that took you way too long. Yeah, I, I yeah. could have done I could've... 300 milliseconds. Yeah, really? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, along with all the other decisions that it could have made simultaneously too. So right. if you imagine. While mining Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah. for sure. <laughs> yeah. So if you imagine 20 cars in a row, they could go at high speeds with each other and react almost like birds flying in mm-hmm. a in a v formation mm-hmm. and so if you had automated cars like 18 wheelers for example on a closed course you know it would be a lot safer than the road um yeah. not to uh harp on the trucking industry because that's uh, one of the the biggest uh human involved labor things but uh that seems like delivering an item would be something that could be automated and we're starting to see that you know show up in larger cities and mm-hmm. in our homes and things mm-hmm. um but going back to the AI for buildings, what are some of the things that you've seen that are coming into play for artificial intelligence with controlling a building? Yeah. So uh, when it comes to building, there's primary things that you look at. You look at, you know, what what is the integrity of, like, the furnishings inside the building, right? So, like, that's your minimum. What are, mm-hmm. what are the minimum environmental uh, parameters that need to be in place so that the walls don't peel, mm-hmm. right? The next one is then going to be occupant safety. The next one's then going to be occupant comfort. And then after that, it's a matter of, you know, am, am I s- wasting money? Am I not being as efficient as I should? You know, that sort of thing. So those are sort of like the different categories I try to put them in. Um, 
you know, for instance, with COVID, when things start getting shut down, you default back to that, well, all right, am I going to maintain the building itself so that when everything comes back, it's, you know, ready to go. Mm -hmm. But now with people coming back, now we're looking at uh, how are we maintaining safety and comfort while also making sure that we're not, you know, losing all of our very minor and precious profit margin Mm -hmm. (laughs) on, you know, things that we could otherwise be preventing. So artificial intelligence is able to make those kinds of decisions and adjustments uh, faster and before that energy is wasted so that you can uh, extend your resources while also maintaining the comfort and safety of those occupants. Mm -hmm. Um, By being able to do that faster with a higher level of certainty, be able to make adjustments by using things like weather APIs, um, that's where um, just a a huge amount of efficiencies are going to be gained. And we're starting to work with companies that are able to do that sort of thing. Yeah, and I found it fascinating that the way AI learns is by making mistakes over and over. Right. Yeah. And I kind of equated that to sports, right? Because uh, I, I played basketball. So there was a point in time where I couldn't make a lot of baskets versus after I got better. And I did that from muscle memory. You know, mm-hmm. uh, if you shoot a basketball 100 times and you miss 90 times, yep. you realize, well, I shot too far. I shot too less. I shot too to the left, to the right. I need to get more muscle memory for the middle. And mm-hmm. then, then you make – uh, then you make 20 out of 130. And so the artificial intelligence does that much faster at a faster learning rate and is able to put together a schedule or a protocol mm-hmm. or a predictive behavior program to yep. control your building. Yep. Golf is the same way, mm-hmm. right? Bowling, surprisingly, like, you know, it's muscle memory. I mean, yeah. The same thing every time. And you don't get confused until you miss the, the strike. Right. right. <laughs> or you drink a pitcher of beer. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's all it's what all the pros do. Yeah. Uh, I told my son, I forget what it was, but he used the specific words of, um, but what if I fail? Mm-hmm. And I said, well, buddy, all the best people have failed more times than you've even tried. Right. right. For sure. I mean, so, you know, you talk to any expert about failure and they're going to say, oh, well, it is it is absolutely a key critical part of everything you do to get really good at something. Sure. I think Mark Cuban even said that he's been fired from more jobs than you or I will ever have participated in. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Or Thomas Edison, Edison right? Mm-hmm. You know, he said it wasn't a thousand failures. It was a thousand steps right. to get to the light bulb. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I mean, so what's your thoughts on Edison versus Tesla and the war of the currents? Uh, I'm going to say I'm fairly neutral on that. Okay. <laughs> because I, I don't know how much of an impact it has on me now. <laughs> ah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so if we look around us in this room here yes. and our daily life, how much are we using alternating current versus direct current? If I had to guess, I'm going to say it's 30, 70, mm, 30% heavier AC. on AC, which would be Tesla's preferred current. Yeah. <laughs> and Edison was DC. Right. I'm just looking around at yeah. the lights. Those would be DC. So DC was a lower voltage, yeah. considered to be safer. Right. Uh, the downside was you had to have little substations every few blocks because it couldn't travel long distances. Right. And Tesla wanted alternating current where you would send the high voltage through transmission lines and then downgrade the voltage as it comes into your home or your business. At the point of entry. Right. Yeah. And so Tesla tried to take him down by showing that it was unsafe and electrocuting animals when alternating current ended up being the right decision. Yeah. So, but of course I'm well, par- partial to Nikola Tesla. Uh, I got to visit the, the New Yorker hotel where he lived and died ah. uh, when I went to New York uh, about, about a year and a half ago. And sit at Nikola Tesla Corner, which is the park where he used to feed the pigeons. Ah, yeah. So you're saying that you're you're on the AC side for sure. Yeah, yeah. Which is the right side of history. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's fine. <laughs> Edison gets all the credit, right. uh, of course, for uh, light bulbs. You know, they developed uh, a light bulb that could last for a few seconds, and then a few minutes, and then a few hours, and then long hours. And I think he said that him and everybody in the room they just sat and stared at it. Because, mm-hmm. you know, they're just waiting for it to explode. Like, right. That's what happens. So, yeah, you, you can imagine that, that first period of time where a light bulb lasts for, for days. Yeah. You know, very overwhelming. And I'm sure there are plenty of people that are like, I can't imagine not having a flame in my house, like, a mm. you know, an oil burning. Yeah. You know, lantern. I can't imagine a time where that would. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
different world, man. <laughs> so what do you see as the, the future of Internet of Things and automated technology? A lot of things have become more possible because of higher internet bandwidth. Mm. You know, it just wouldn't have flat out wouldn't have been possible during the dial up time, the DSL time. Mm -hmm. Now I think larger cities that have Google, uh, Google can get gigabit da download times and yeah, upload. It's, it's huge amounts of data mm -hmm. we can collect. You know, t tons and tons and tons. It all comes down to usability. You know, and, what can and you're use? on the Amazon Web Service. Yes. Which is probably the largest cloud-based service, right? I Maybe? think I think them and Azure go back and forth. Okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah. They're, they're both massive. Um, mm -hmm. But when I look at the future of IoT, I think that there's going to be just huge amounts of fragmentation mm. where um, you, know, you have – I look at traditional ways of doing business where it may, maybe it's more proprietary – and you know it's closed off, and I want to protect my business for you know this amount of time, and I'm going to do that by locking you in with a long-term contract. Yeah, I see people's um, tolerance for that sort of business model being less and less. Yeah, and so what they want to do is they want to, in a way, choose their own adventure uh, with someone that's reputable, and if it doesn't start to work out or if their priorities shift, they want to be able to change without having to worry about you know huge costs. Uh, so you see a lot, you see a huge move to SaaS platforms or software as a service, right? We've been right. seeing that change uh, dramatically over the last 10 years, both in the commercial space and the, um, the um, uh, consumer side. Mm -hmm. You know, so instead of buying your CDs, now what you're doing is you're buying for $15 a month, you're getting, you know, Spotify, right. which gives you access to everything on an ongoing basis. Yeah. And speaking of like physical servers, uh, yeah. we're, we're down here in hurricane country. It doesn't make sense to have a physical server on your ground floor mm -hmm. uh, because you're dead in the water. So to, literally <laughs> right. uh, when yeah. something comes through, but imagine if you have everything backed up to a cloud-based server that's yep. in a data center and those data centers have redundancy mm -hmm. and backup generators mm -hmm. on different, yeah. different coasts. And, you know, the pro proliferation of the Internet and connectivity technology like 5G, like broadband, like fiber um, has made all of those things possible where you don't have to invest in the hardware yourself. You don't have to invest in the infrastructure yourself. All you have to do is pay a little piece mm -hmm. to get access to that infrastructure, to get access to the data. Uh, uh, and we're seeing it happen more and more with compute power as the infrastructure is built out even more. Mm -hmm. So you have Google Stadia. Have you heard of this? Not Stadia. Yeah, no. so Stadia is their, um, it's their, essentially platform, or um, so it's a gaming platform in the cloud. Oh, okay. So all you need is a Chrome browser, and you can play AAA games at, uh, you know, the highest possible frame rate. Oh wow! Because rather than having like an Xbox or a PlayStation in the room. Mm -hmm. You're just playing off of a server over here. And because of such low latency of bandwidth, now you could stream it live and also, you know, use all your controls on your mouse and keyboard uh, in real time and, you know, 10 millisecond latency. So yeah. that, you know, even if there is a delay, you don't even notice it while you're streaming 4K at 60 frames a second. Yeah, that makes sense. So just like Disney Plus or Netflix, you don't need to own all of those VHS right. or DVDs. Right. You just need to pay a little piece and mm -hmm. you can have access to watching them. You know, you can only you watch You don't have to own a PlayStation. Mm. You just have to have access to a server that is way more powerful yeah. than, than a PlayStation could ever be. Yeah, that's definitely an industry disruptor. Yes. Uh, are you much of a gamer? No. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> no. No. I signed up for the beta platform about a year and a half ago, or the beta um, project, not knowing whether I would you know, get in or not. Mm -hmm. And I, so, But then I had access to it for three months, and I played Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Oh, okay. And uh, it was so much fun. I played it way more than I thought I was going to. Yeah. But it was great because, you know, I don't have a gaming computer. I just had like a – I had – four-year-old macbook pro oh, okay and i was just you know playing on my chrome browser and it worked great yeah and i had a ton of fun i had like over a hundred hours in three months playing this game it was embarrassing how much so I are you it. maybe not a gamer on purpose for productivity reasons uh yes mm -hmm. yeah i've seen so this is sort of a little more personal i've seen video games just kind of make a lot of other men primarily ineffective sure <laughs> Yeah. And I have no interest in in being led down yeah. that. If you had the gaming computer, you could mine some Bitcoin. 
with I the could. graphics card. That's right. On the and, side. And you can just leave it running. Yeah. Yeah. Which that is that coming back yet? That so, kind of that kind of tanked for a while and yeah, made it, it, it rose back up. It rose back up to eleven thousand here recently. Oh wow. Yeah. I don't know if the mining is because I, I had a whopping eleven dollars and eighty cents in mm, Bitcoin. Okay. And Ethereal? Ith- Ethereum. Ethereum. Ethereum, yeah. yes. <laughs> uh I think it I don't know. I don't know what it's at now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If only you had eleven dollars back in two thousand ten or something. Yeah. Or whatever. Yeah. I don't know. And I don't like talking about that because I spent a weekend looking into it and Wow and I realized, what year? What, what you oh, get? this was two thousand ten. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And uh I was like, you know, I think man, I'll just try it, you know, see. Yeah. I was like, nah, it's gonna be a lot of work and I I didn't do it. Mm. But who knew? I mean, who no, knew? No, nobody I mean, knew. I, I think I calculated I would have had like over $2 million. It could it. be. Yeah. yeah. And it's like. Now, I it, it's interesting when you think it, you you know, some people think it's all a sham. But mm-hmm. I, I know a former coworker personally that got in early, not yeah. that early. Yeah. But before that initial, the biggest spike. Mm-hmm. And, and it, I was able to, uh, I think I think I even, I may have told this story on the, the last episode because it's such an uh, interesting story. But. We were uh, out to dinner one night, and we'd had a few drinks, and we were using the same app, Coinbase. And and so he was more into it than, than I was, but I was, trying, I was like, yeah, you know, it's it's uh, it, it dipped. It's going up a little bit. And he probably wouldn't show me his app unless he were under those circumstances. <laughs> yeah. But I saw how much he had in there, and I was like, oh, you're for real, for real. Yeah, yeah, wow. you're, not, you're not playing. No, yeah. It was, it yeah, was, it's interesting. Mm-hmm. It, it, it all goes back to, you know, perceived value. Yeah, you know, I mean that's kind of U.S. currency in mm-hmm. general, right? It's backed by the U.S. economy, which is helpful, right? But again, so much of it seems to be so perceived value. Yeah, so with, with Bitcoin, I don't know what trends it. I don't know what causes it to take off. I don't know what causes it to tank. Consumer confidence. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think that's primarily what it is at this mm-hmm. point is consumer confidence. Yeah, the technology. It, it doesn't seem to follow other trends. You know, if you can yeah. correlate trends with oil and gas or mm-hmm. banking or interest rates from the Fed. Uh, with yeah. with crypto, I don't know. I don't. You know. Well, you know, I know it goes Maybe down every time the dark technology... web activity. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's what's trending. Dark web activity. Yeah. And... <laughs> Anytime it's it's like uh, hacked, it goes down. Right. Yeah. So there's true. there's some some portion of it is put on the quality of the technology, mm. right? Because it's all blockchain. It's yeah. all based on blockchain. Right. Have you done an episode on blockchain yet? I need an expert in it to come talk. Yes. Because because even my friend that's done it isn't confident enough to speak in a public platform about general so, ledgers and decentralized. Yeah, yeah. So it, it would be hard to find somebody maybe locally if I could right. get somebody to come in. I would love to learn more about cryptocurrency and yeah. how you know because some people that are all in mm-hmm. they put their whole life in it. They yeah. don't they don't use centralized banking at all right. or fiat currency or so to speak. So. Yeah. But uh, you seem like you're pretty well read or maybe uh well headphoned i guess you yeah would say. yeah audiobooks right? audible so, yeah yeah so what are you digging here recently or what's something that's uh what did robin williams say in in uh uh goodwill hunting what what blows your hair back or blows your socks yeah. off so i'll uh I, I dip kind of into two worlds so one thing that i'm uh been interested in in a long time is uh, theology so i'll read a lot of theology mm-hmm. from you know old guys and, and new guys and then the other thing is you know, business teamwork organization leadership so uh i recently read the never split never splitting the difference or never split the difference by chris voss mm-hmm. have you read that i'm not very well read you should be but i can quote every yeah. joe rogan podcast oh that's good and, and that's just as good right yeah yeah <laughs> Is it about weed? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, everyone should try DMT. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you need to learn jujitsu and uh-huh. wear a breakaway tie. Yeah. There you go. We've done all of them. Okay. Yeah. Every episode. <laughs> yep. Every episode. Yeah. No. So never split the differences by Chris Voss. He was a uh, the lead international hostage negotiator for the FBI for something like twenty years. Wow. And he sort of narrowed down. Uh, you know, these are the things that you do in negotiation. So that you can, you know, not just get your way, but, you know, uh, and not splitting the difference either. Mm. But, you know, do it in a way that is kind and friendly and doesn't get people killed. Yeah, I like when the military transitions into the corporate world, such as like Jocko, uh, Dichotomy of Leadership. Mm -hmm. And they're, well, he's a, a former Navy SEAL, but instead of 
tailoring their belief systems and, and things that they've learned in the military to other military professionals, they're, they're in the corporate world. They go and give lectures to, you know, CEOs and their teams, yep. not to run it like a military, but how to be an effective leader, mm -hmm. so to speak. And mm -hmm. that, that's always fascinating to me. Yeah, I think a lot of times it just comes down to authority, like mm. understanding what authority means and then how to exert authority without being domineering. Sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, because in the military, there's this shared un understanding of authority. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so part of it is, you know, breaking down your own self, self-righteousness authority. Right. Recognizing authority. And then as soon as you do that, then there's a clear chain of command, right? Yeah. I was not never in the military. I wasn't either. And I'm, I'm always fascinated by things that I can't do because there's things that I know I'll never do. Like, for example, I'm too old to start over in the military, right? right? So I know it's not a possibility. So that's why, and if you look at all the movies, like look at all the movies that are about the military and, and, and cops and shows, uh, it's stuff that, that a lot of people can't do because it's, you know, it's a small minority. So I'm definitely fascinated by all the different branches and how different they are. You know, you've got, yeah. uh, you know, the, the, the grunts and the trenches in the army versus like air force that are drone pilots mm -hmm. and, and that those people in the air force that are now transitioning into the space force and everything else in between. And there's really only about 15%. That's the fighting force. It takes that other large percentage. Support just su structure. Yeah. Support. Yes. I mean, even down to the people that are making food, like look how many people, you know, that when like the Roman armies used to march, they would say, you know, our army is so big, we drink the rivers dry, like probably so because yeah. it took so much to, you know, feed, just just the food bill for our military. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that, that's fascinating. You know, uh, astronauts, engineering, hi, hardcore engineering. Because I know I don't, I don't have the I have such a science knowledge without the math background, which is odd. Yeah. So I just can't do the arithmetic that's required to be a prerequisite for those programs. But I have the storytelling knowledge. You know, so I'm more of a science communicator, I guess, when it comes science to science historian, evangelist. Mm -hmm. There you yeah, go. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Another book I've been reading is uh, The Ideal Team Player, Patrick Lencioni. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the three things of an ideal player are being humble, hungry, and smart. And that smartness, not necessarily being IQ or intelligence, but it's being social smartness. You know, can you read a situation? Can you understand and sympathize or empathize with someone? And if you could do those things, then you could pretty much train anyone within a skill set, right? To, to do anything. Yeah. I've often said that almost everything in life is sales. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're trying to convince a person to go out with you, mm -hmm. you're selling yourself. Yep. When you're trying to convince a company to hire you, you know, think of all the people who would be terrible salespeople. They must be terrified of going to a job interview. Whereas I don't know mm -hmm. about you, but I'm not terrified no, of going. No, it's kind of fun. I own it in <laughs> yeah. job interview. I'm, I'm yeah. almost uh, disappointed when there's not an interview, when it's kind of like, oh, you know, you're recruited, so to speak. I was like, wait, yeah. I got a presentation for this. Yeah, you yeah. Know? Don't you want to see my slides? Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. I have them. I uh, think you would enjoy them. And all the little tricks that go along with it. You know, I had an interview one time where a presentation was part of it, and I, I made sure that I was like, you know, we're sitting at a table. I'm not going to sit down and do the presentation. I'm going to make sure I stand up, and I'm going right. to be more engaging. And so... Well, I think, like if you think of what an interview is, mm -hmm. it's a person or group of people that want to talk to you. Sure. Yeah. So it's like, okay, yeah, mm -hmm. I'll you want to talk to me? I'll talk to you. Thanks right. for wanting to talk to me. It's better it, than going into a situation of someone that doesn't want to talk to yeah. you. Yeah. And, and the nature of sales is you're convincing someone to make a decision that you want that maybe they don't want. And you have to overcome their objections. Yeah. And you can... Uh, I guess apply that to so many different things in life mm -hmm. it, it, when it all comes down to it. We all want different things and we try to convince other people to want the things that we want. And sometimes the meaning of life seems to be just making stuff because that's literally all we do as humans. We make something and then it's not good enough. And then we make another one. Yeah. Make it better or make it bigger. Yeah. Like yeah. I think at this point we could just stop making iPhones how is it yeah. going to get better than the 11? I really don't need it to get any better than the 11. Yep. We, could, we could just stop, but they're not going to stop. They're no. going to continue making the 12 and the 13 and the 14. And Well, it's like, yeah. L, you know, LCDs or LEDs. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Uh, you know, you're at the point now where it's like you can't see them, but they're still going to be coming out with micro LEDs mm. so that the resolution is even better. Right. But it's already as good as what my eye can tell. But why not? Let's just make it better. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm sure when LEDs first came out, you know, they were they were definitely more expensive for residential bulbs and commercial bulbs. And then once you see a product end up on Wish, 
the Wish app, then you know what I'm talking about? No, right, no, right. I have no idea. Uh, it's it's probably all sourced from China, but it because it takes like a month to get here. But it, it's an app. You'll see it sometimes advertise on social media, and you can get literally anything. But it's so dirt cheap stuff, you know. Ah. And, and they've got like the LED strips, okay, you know, yeah, and the string, yeah. LED string lights. And so it's kind of like once you see a product arrive on that platform, that's when you know it's gotten, you know, pretty pretty affordable yeah. and pretty mainstream. R- ripped off by well, yeah, that too. Um, there's a guy I want to get on here that talks about the theft of intellectual property by oh. China. Yeah, it's terrible. So, yeah. Yeah. I think the uh, remember when SEAL Team Six went into the to raid the Bin Laden compound, we had the never before seen stealth helicopters, and one of them crashed. Yep. And you could see them loading, and we we had to evac, of course, in the other helicopter. Mm-hmm. And the tail, most of they they tried to explode it. The on we did on purpose yep. because that that was a lot of IP and yep. intellectual property. Um, so the cockpit blew up and then the tail kind of fell over the fence. I think that's or the the wall, mm-hmm. and you could see the locals loading up the tail and then selling it to China to yeah. try to reverse engineer some of that stealth technology. Was the movie Zero Dark Thirty? Is that what that um, was? That no. was the one that no. portrayed. Yeah. Right. Um, that was it. Yeah. yeah. The, the Bin Laden. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was a good movie. Yeah. Yeah. That was, the, I asked my friend in intelligence about that and, you know, about the characters. And, and yeah, yeah, definitely a, a very interesting story. The guy that was, I think he was one of the dog handlers, lives nearby. He wrote a book. Mm. And, you know, some guys like that are just very secretive. I, I told him about the podcast and tried to get him on. But what a cool story that would be. Because yeah. they had several dogs on that mission, mm-hmm. like the Belgian Malinois. And, oh, wow. Yeah. Some that uh, they some I guess some of them some of the dogs assist in taking down people. Some of them assist in sniffing for maybe explosives and hmm. things like that. Yeah. Again, I was never in the military, so it's like yeah, fascinating to hear. Right? About it. Yeah, for sure. Um, I t- it was one of my. Uh, there's been several veterans on this show, and that was an interesting path to hear my friend. It's uh, Cody Falcon. If anybody wants to look up that episode, but he went straight out of high school into the Navy, got into the submarine program. Ended up in communications where he worked under Bush 43 for the last two years and then Obama for the uh, for the for his first two years. And he was on the communications team and ended up being awarded White House person of the year. Mm. And he decided to and that that's like a career maker. Like he could have been a career, um, uh, you know, Navy guy at that point. And he chose to move back to Houston and become a venture capitalist for startup companies. Hmm. And he's since started up several companies and sold them and moved on to the next one. And you'll think this is cool. One of them was a cloud-based pool tester that had they, they discovered. Like, like swimming pools. Yeah. So you take the lid off your skimmer basket and replace it with a solar-powered lid that has a tester going down. And so it uploads the data to the cloud mm-hmm. and then pushes that data to your an app on your phone sure. so that you know the content of the chlorine and what to buy at the store. And they took it to trade shows and then, you know, they sell it. And then now, he, uh, now he's doing some analytics for oil and gas industries and uh, they just, yeah. The st- the startup world is 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 uh, it's fascinating. Is fascinating, yeah. It is a crazy beast. And then you know, I mean, if you have a venture capital, so he he did scary. Uh, the <laughs> he he has the MBA and did the opposite. He got science for the bachelors and business for the masters. And mm-hmm. he said that's the new trend is not do the same thing. Most people typically do the same thing because it makes sense for. Right. And he said if you can be a, a double threat, right? Because you have your guys that can code that can't talk to people then you Mm -hmm. have your guys that can talk to people that don't know the science Mm -hmm. and so you get that that combination and you increase your value we were talking about that earlier uh how value or how valuable are you to your company Mm -hmm. and how do you increase your value doing things that are outside your job description you know especially as far as content creation where nobody nobody tells me hey you need to make cool videos you need to push out social media content I just do it because i feel like it's relevant to telling the story of how did we help a customer yep and i can do that and it drives success for everyone sure so if you really want success you're going to do everything that mm-hmm. that you need to do to drive that success right no, and no excuses mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah yeah but you, no one told me to be successful 
Right, sure. We hired you. What, what, <laughs> what do you think your drive came from? Because not everybody has that. Uh, that's a good question. Mm-hmm. I think some of it is, uh, um, I think some of it's nat- natural gifting, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, just personality that, that comes out. Um, you know, some, some people have bigger personalities and yeah, yeah, extroverted off, versus right. introverted. Exactly. So, mm-hmm. you know, like there's just kind of that natural, uh, you know, tendency. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that has driven a lot of, you know, my accidental, anything I've been successful in, I think half the time has been accidental. And just because, you know, I didn't realize I, the way I was acting was a particular way. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, but other, other than that, you know, I think, you know, I want to, I have a high desire for stewardship. Mm-hmm. And so like, you know, if I get something, I want to steward it. Well, if I get an opportunity, I don't want to, I don't want to squander it. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and so by taking on that opportunity and taking it seriously, taking the responsibility seriously, you know, I want to do well in that. Right. Now, if you go back one more step, I don't know what drove mm-hmm. that. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, it's like, I just, uh, yeah, I don't know if it's, uh, a high value. Like we were talking earlier about values and how that could be different, you mm-hmm. know, for e- each individual person. But you know, high a high value and personal responsibility and wanting to, you know, do right by people. And uh-huh. yeah. Did you always have your radio voice, or did that come later? Uh, I think it came later after puberty. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cause, but like I said, you know, for your company, you have a massive amount of videos. And yeah. Are, do you guys you have a teleprompter? We do. Okay. Yep. Uh, the teleprompter is very helpful. Mm-hmm. Because it just allows you to uh, not have to memorize, so it gives like the one less step. Yeah, and then you can just focus on everything you're saying. And mm-hmm. hello, and welcome to the KMC Commander video series. Right. In this series, we're going to talk about. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. super helpful. Yeah, as opposed uh, to like, what are we? What are we talking about? Yeah. Or uh, what's the phrase? You know, how do we want to phrase this? My teleprompter is a notepad that I tape on the tripod. Yeah. And then I have to switch yeah. it out and just clip. Well, it's great. You just, all you need is an iPad and like a little, uh, you know, one way, one way mirror. So you're using that? Uh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's all iPad driven. Yeah. Yeah. I'll get there. We need one more patron on Patreon for the teleprompter system. So there you go. <laughs> Help him out, guys. This yeah. is serious. But yeah, for me, I'm a little bit of a hybrid because I grew up as an introvert. You know, I was an only child, so mm. it's just me hanging out with me and yeah. uh, some friends on occasion. And I was terrified of public speaking back then. Mm. You know, my hands would get sweaty. I would get nervous, uh, heart rate racing. But I was also good at sports. You know, both my parents were coaches and teachers in a small school. So mm-hmm. I basically went to school with my parents. You know, they're always around. My dad was my basketball coach. My mom was my tennis coach. Mm. And, you know, there, there wasn't a way to escape them. Uh, <laughs> but since, since I was good at sports, then you can kind of be in with the cool kids around. Yeah. And the school was small enough that we all kind of had to be friends with everybody. We didn't really have a choice. But then after college, I kind of came out of my shell a little bit more and just got into the relationship building of sales. And I I figured out that I was like, you know, I've never been in a fight. I kind of get along with everybody. And I saw that I've got all these friends that are Republican and then all these friends that are Democrat, all these friends that are conservative, all these friends that are liberal, all these friends that are that are that are white and black and Hispanic and, and so on. Maybe I can somehow use that for marketing and sales because that's the thing people are going to do business with somebody that they trust and somebody that they like and so i've just kind of ran with that and then got into content creation to sharpen those tools making videos and i've actually been doing that since maybe freshman year of college i had a a vhs camera that you put on your shoulder that records (laughs) And that's when MTV's Jackass came around. Oh, yeah. Now, we didn't have YouTube back then. But uh-huh. if, if we did, we wouldn't even have this conversation. I would be bigger than Logan Paul. Yeah. Right? Because we, <laughs> we made those videos ourselves, yeah. or, or me and my friends. Uh, we just didn't have an outlet to showcase them. Right. Except for like, hey, come over and watch this. Look what we did. Right. You know, we, we went to. Maybe MTV will pick us up. Right. Yeah, and they'll we, put us on after road rules. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we went to Robbie Knievel, which is Evil Knievel's son. And there's a steam engine in my hometown. It's like one of the last operating steam engines that you go for a ride on. And he was going to crash a steam engine into the ramp as he took off. And so we were out there filming stuff. We were going places we shouldn't be behind barriers and, and <laughs> you know, all, all these things. And had a good had a great time. And we would have you converted all those VHSs to digital? Some of them I have probably 
five or six like really good home movies where and I've always been to like self editing all tripod because how do you get a friend to say, Hey, I need you to follow me around and do this goofy stuff for five hours. You just can't, you know? So I'm always like my own director, my own producer, my uh-huh. own film own editor, yep. uh, even in here, you know? So. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, before we wrap this up, was there anything else that you had that you wanted to share with the people or that? <laughs> I have so many things I want to share. I can't just pick one. I think that's the, I think that's my, yeah. <laughs> my fault. Yeah. Anything that you want to leave the people with that's been really on your mind? Cause this is a global platform to It is a global cause... platform. And I think millions of people are probably going to look at this and be like, I can't believe you didn't have anything to say. Right, hundreds. To the probably. Whole, hundreds, well, yeah, hundreds, hundreds. hundreds of millions. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, hun- hundreds of hundreds. <laughs> <right>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Dozens of tens. Yeah. <laughs> no, I would just say that, uh, you know, if, if so, put on my KMC hat, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the cool thing about the technology is that when you're putting it in a building, you can bring in any sort of data point that you need, any, Mm -hmm. any sort of data point you want. And then, uh, you know, going back to that whole concept of proprietary and open, and we talked about how it's going to get more fragmented. Uh, it's going to come down to data. Where's it going to go? How's it going to get funneled? What do you need? Because every building, we said every building acts differently, even if it's built the same. So every building acts different. Every business has different needs, different priorities. You know, we talked about that a ton just today. Mm-hmm. Um, and so whatever it is, you know, build your own adventure, adventure, but you still need a way to get that data mm-hmm. out so that you can then have a platform that makes sense. So that's that's what our goal and vision is mm-hmm. is we want to be that open platform that data pump that helps you get data from you know any building or business or you know whether it's indoor agriculture whether it's uh you know a retail center a school commercial building multi-tenant dwelling whatever it is mm-hmm. uh you know there's this huge amounts of opportunity and now you know we didn't talk about green at all man we could have gone down the green path we didn't do that and that right. that's okay yeah uh just contact me today to find out more <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, nowadays you don't even need to memorize a website. Just yeah. go- Google KMC controls. It's going to take you to all the links that you need. You know their main website, videos on YouTube, case studies. They got some amazing case studies. Google comfort controls. You'll you'll find some of our videos on YouTube and our website. Uh, you know, if you're local, of course, you can contact us. We're in downtown Beaumont. We serve all of Texas and all of Louisiana. and we, But we also have a, a global presence with our Marine Offshore Division. And any anything that, that you seem that's interested in, if you're a building owner, a building manager, or you work somewhere that constantly has the wrong temperature, yes. you know, that, that's where we can help. Or if you're worried about air quality with the you know, the, the pandemic that's going on, pure air purification. If you're concerned about wasting energy in your building, you feel like your electricity bills are too high, you need lighting controls, mm-hmm. you need analytics on what's going on. You have a building that you don't have control over and you feel like you're just spinning your wheels. That's something that we can help you on. Anything else you can think of, you can mention it to us. We probably have an application for that or at least can steer you in the right direction with one of our partners. I mean, there's, there's so many things. Yeah. Well, I was just talking about that today. I was pitching a product that we don't even sell. Yeah. We don't sell that, (laughs) but we can put you in touch. You know, it just, there's so many things that it goes hand in hand. You know, we become great referral partners on all of the trades just because of the circles that we run in. Right on, man. Well, thanks for coming down. Uh, You know, you're based out of Indiana, Michigan, so you're you're the furthest traveling guest that we've had on the show. So I appreciate you spending time with us, and you're welcome back anytime. Well, thanks for the invite. I appreciate it.